Hi, I'm with Juliana Spar, who's coming to visit us for the Utah Humanities Book Fest and the Humanities in the Wild series. And she's agreed to speak with me and answer a few questions so that we can get extra excited for her visit. Hi, Juliana. Hi. Can you describe your poetry for audience members who aren't as familiar with your work? Um, give us perhaps a brief Ars Poetica. Um, sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I think when I have to describe my work, I'm always kind of jokingly say that I'm the monstrous child of U.S. experimentalism and um, also the literatures of anti-colonialism. So I kind of mean both, you know, Gertrude Stein and Teresa Hotkin Shaw and also someone like Cesare or Kialo Muku, who is like an early 18th century Hawaiian poet. Um, and I think what I mean by that is something about how I value atypical language use over standard English, polyphony over singularity. Um, you know, consider myself interested in modernism more than confessionalism. I, I saw um, that you lived in Hawaii. Is that how you got interested in the Hawaiian work or did, did you already have that interest before? No, it was when I moved to Hawaii. Okay. <laughs> I was jealous. I was like, that must have been so cool. Um, so I read your poem responding was one of the ones that I read in preparation to talk to you today. And I really was struck by that line. Um, it is impossible to speak about something. It is only possible to speak beside it. And I wanted to ask you because a lot of the work that I found of yours and you know, descriptions of your work talk about your work as politically engaging and engaging with conversations that are happening in larger culture in a very direct way. And I just wanted to ask you how you see the relationship between poetry and political activism, particularly in this current moment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's such an old line. I was like, I was slightly amused by it because I was like, I, couldn't, I can't imagine writing that now. Really? <laughs> I really like it. Thanks. Um, I mean, I, I think a poetry's relationship to political activism is like really weird and contradictory and um, not super, not, not necessarily super close or doesn't entirely make sense. Um, so on the one hand, like poetry is, is kind of undeniably the genre of literature that's most likely to show up at a protest or most likely to be scrawled on like a cardboard sign that people have, you know, held up. Like, a, you know, you've seen like lines from Emily Dickinson and, you know, endless things at protests um, around that. And people often read poems at protests, um, which I think often suggests that there's this really um, much more robust relationship than there is because at the same time, poetry is like one of the most elite art forms um, one of the most divorced from everyday life. Um, one of the genres of literature that has the most, the smallest of all the audiences, <laughs> um, and it's really small. Um, and so, I mean, there's, so I think that that contradiction is always kind of interesting, but um, whenever anyone says that like their poetry is their activism, I'm always like, nah, I'm, not, I'm slightly suspicious of that mm -hmm. in general. Um, but at the same time, I always think that like, you know, like, content about life, which often gets coded political, you know, often shows up in poetry in, in, the, in these ways. And it's often kind of interesting and I find it often inspiring and I like to read it at the same time. And you do, you are like a politically active. I was reading about your uh, work in the encampments and you were actually, you weren't just writing poems, you were actually in the encampments of the 2011 Occupy movement. Is that right? So you're kind of doing both at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't feel like I show up in those places as a poet, really. I just kind of like try to show up as a body. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, I wondered if um, there was so much excitement about the, um, the poet at the inaugurations, uh, at the presidential inauguration that I was like, maybe this is the moment that poetry will become <laughs> the, political, the political weapon that we need right now. Um, yeah, we're seeing, a, I mean, we are, I mean, it's kind of interesting. The one thing that's been really interesting about the last five or 10 years in some ways is that we're, I feel like we are starting to see a kind of um, uh, an interest in political poetry from the state in a way that we have it in the past. And mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Amanda Gorman reading was a kind of example of that. Definitely. Well, um, would you mind reading a poem for us? No, I'll read um, this. I mean, how long does it matter? This is like a page and a half. I mean, two and a half pages. That's that great. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess you can always cut it if it's too long. Um, 
I got asked to write a poem for about the Capitol scene and um, this is the poem that I wrote, which I don't know, maybe it is about that or maybe not. <laughs> um, and the big long waves surge through the inter-reef passages and break on the outermost reefs. There is a sea foam made from the strong hydrodynamic forces, a witness of sorts to tidal flows, surf zones, those powerful turbulent jets and eddies around the flanks of reef. Beneath the whiteness, the coral on the shallow bottom rests its cells in the dappled sunlight. And there is also the single-celled algae. Two forms of energy and capture these two as a lover and a beloved and a lyric. When the waves are low, there is sunlight. And so the holiobont is happy growing. When the water is turbid, when the light is limited, then corals eat the algae. This too, a form of happy. By eating, I mean the algae lives inside the digestive cavity of the coral. By happy, I mean the give and take of vitamins, trace elements, nutrients, carbon dioxide, that should be understood as the most primal of loves. The lesson here, one of living in or on one another so as to build, maintain, and defend. One could make a politics of it. That is what confused Ovid did. Misunderstanding the coral as stone, not understanding its life. In his telling, Perseus created it when he nestled Medusa's head and plants he found below the waves. This was right after he slayed the sea monster so as to win Andromeda. Andromeda, she too was something else, something impossible for him to recognize, for she is lapped by sea foam, as the lobe puts it, meaning she was of this intertidal realm of the coral and the algae. When Perseus arrives, he pulls her out and away, and what follows is a supposed first representation of a man falling in love with a woman on a stage. No one ever says anything about Andromeda falling in love. And of course, why would they? Andromeda seems rather aware that her options are limited to slave or wife or servant. It is not all there in a story retold so many times. Is it not all we need to know about how hard it is for us to go forward? And also all the ways possible to. Beneath the foam is all the symbiosis that a vacunus could want. A poet too, all the metaphor a poet could want. All the choices for imagining survival as living in or on one another and the coral rich intertidal zone of Andromeda, fish flickering in and out, the big long wave surging through the inter reef passages to break on the outermost reef, where a seafoam is made from the strong hydrodynamic forces. There, a witness to tidal flows, surf flows, the franks of reef. Thank you, Juliana. I really appreciate you taking the time talking to me today and thank you for reading a poem. Thank you.